Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the closing keynote of EDI 2.0, Individual Responsibility for Creating Belonging and Connection in the Library Profession. We've had a great day, really terrific. Special thanks to San Jose State University School of Information, the founding partner for the conference. And with that, we'll turn time over to Dr. Sandra Hirsch. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank everyone for such a rich uh, conversation that we've had today. I've, I've dropped into many of the breakout sessions and they've all been really fantastic and really excellent questions and discussions. And I uh, enjoyed being part of the opening keynote. Just a huge thank you again to Julius Jefferson for all the work that he did in partnering with us to put this all together. And I'm super excited to hear his closing keynote and his final remarks today. And it also a big thanks to uh, Steve Hargadon, as usual, for always doing such an outstanding job and helping us um, uh, put on these outstanding programs. So I'm going to, with no further ado, I'd love to turn it back to Steve and to um, Julius to um, let us hear the closing keynote. So thank you again. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Um, this has been uh, an outstanding experience. Um, I just really want to thank everyone for participating and joining us in this conference. Um, I want to let everyone know that it would not be possible, um, Sandy, without your vision and without the capable leadership of Dr. Anthony Chow and all of the great folks at San Jose State University. Um, again, I want to thank the outstanding keynote panel and, and thanks to all of the presenters for uh, their enlightened and informed content. Um, logistically, as you said, Sandy, this would not have been possible without Steve Hargadon, who keeps all the trains running on time. And I'm sure there are a whole bunch of other folks that I don't even know about that helped to make this conference possible. This has been a great experience for me. So I just really just, uh, I want to share a few final thoughts uh, about this idea of creating spaces where everyone feels like they belong and they're connected. Um, so the theme of my remarks are sort of like the theme that we heard, unbeknownst to me that we were going to hear this in the in the opening keynote. Um, and it's so who will do this work? Um, and that's really what I had in mind when we put this together. Like who is doing this work? Who will do this work. And so today we heard from a panel of engaged leaders in our profession who discuss challenges to creating a climate of belonging and being connected both for our communities and those who use our library spaces. And uh, these are all include individuals who we work side by side, uh, our colleagues. In many cases, we spend more time with our colleagues and, than our own families. Um, we heard from 11 pr provocative and diverse session presenters highlighting the great work being done in libraries to create belongingness. That was the whole point. Um, so who will do this work? We, we are seeing that there are people committed to doing this work of creating a culture of belongingness and creating connection. Um, I want to highlight um, just a few other examples of folks that are doing this work, creating belonging and in connection in libraries, um, just a few. So I wanna highlight um, one of my colleagues in the North American Regional Division of IFLA, International Federation of Library, Libraries and Associations and Institutions, uh, Camille Collison, who in 2022 helped launch uh, through the National Indigenous Knowledge and Language Alliance, the Respectful Terminology Platform Project, um, which follows decades of, of labor by indigenous peoples and allies working to create, create more respective terminology and accurate representations of indigenous, indigenous people's names, places, and cultural identifiers. I mean, this is just another example of seeing a void and just taking uh, the bull by the horns and doing this work. It's very difficult work, but very important work. I um, also want to highlight uh, a colleague and, and so, somewhat of a mentor. She probably doesn't think it, but she's sort of a mentor of mine, Deborah Caldwell Stone at the office of uh, the Ailey Office for Intellectual Freedom, who has been an advocate in the space of creating 
uh, belongingness for the freedom to read. She's done this work for decades. She's one of the foremost authorities uh, on, on intellectual freedom and an individual who has been doing this work, fighting on the front lines. Um, I also want to highlight um, and give a shout out to my folks on the front line um, that are building connections with their community. Um, my folks at the Hartford Public Library, uh, Bridget, Gwen, Homer, Martha Ray, all my folks there, I just visited them uh, not too long ago uh, and, and listened to staff share how the Hartford Public Library builds uh, belongingness. Um, one of the examples that I heard came from, uh, I say co-worker because I was staff when I visited them, staff for the day, Ada, who works at one of the largest branches uh, in one of the most economically challenged communities in Hartford. And uh, a guy came in inquiring about how to get a, a municipal ID. And he stated that he needed the ID to show social services because he was trying to get services for his daughter. And Ada told him how much the ID would cost. Um, the man told her that uh, he didn't have the money, um, but he would come back. And then Ada told him, wait, wait a second, um, because she was worried that, you know, he wouldn't come back, of course. Um, but while she said, she said, wait, while I checked on, while she checked on some other information for him. And Ada went away and came back and she told the man that she forgot about a program that could help him get an ID and that the fee would be waived. Um, so actually Ada wanted to protect the cut, this particular uh, uh, patron's dignity and she didn't divulge that she paid for the ID out of her own resources. And so what Ada did was she created a connection and she created belongingness in her community and her library. And these are the type of examples uh, that people move forward. These are people who are brave. Um, you know, there are many people doing this work and creating these spaces. But let me let me acknowledge that creating belongingness is very difficult work. And we heard Dr. Dr. Cook talk about this earlier in the opening keynote. Um, she stated that you have to want to do this work and that you must be brave. As we live in a world that thrives on our differences and marginalizes humans for just being. And for me, and I'm sure for many of you, it is just overwhelming at times. And the marginalized communities and those who stand with the marginalized communities often get tired of doing the work and oftentimes suffer a cost for doing the work. And I'm sure that those who do this work uh, know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, doing this work means that you are dis disrupting the status quo. You're disrupting the way things are now. You're disrupting, disrupting the existing order of things. Whenever you disrupt the existing order of things, know that it's going to come at a cost. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, have you ever heard of the expression that life is not fair? Well, why do we accept the fact that sometimes life is not fair? Why don't we begin with, I'm going to do all I can to create fairness in life, even at a cost. That means pushing back against the existing order. Uh, I, I was recently at a, at a library conference uh, where I listened to a session where the presenters talked about how bad the climate was in their libraries. Um, they talked about uh, not feeling like they belong there. Um, there was no connection. Um, these are all library workers. And the the the, the stories went on and on. Um, and I, I thought to myself, yes, you know, join the club. I've been there. Uh, but then I thought about um, like, but what are you, the individual sharing this? What are you going to do about it? Um, certainly, uh, I, I, I believe many felt helpless. They didn't know where to start. Um, I can tell you today, we've heard lots of examples of what individuals can do. Um, we learn possibilities. Um, but personally, I'll tell you that many years ago, um, I witnessed injustice in the workplace, working at a library, and I witnessed injustice. Um, a colleague came to me in confidence, and she said that she was being sexually harassed by our supervisor. 
And I was sick to think that, you know, she was enduring this harassment on a daily basis. Um, this, this was unwanted physical attention. It made her feel helpless. Uh, it made her feel like she didn't belong or she wasn't connected. I mean, when we as library workers don't feel like we belong, um, we cannot create a sense of belongingness for those that we serve. So in my mind, something had to be done. Um, after all, I knew about the behavior. I mean, I had heard about it, you know, but no one had ever came to me. I kind of heard this, this is what the supervisor did. Um, um, but uh, no one wanted to address the situation for something we talked about earlier, fear, fear of reprisal, uh, fear of being isolated, fear of being put in a corner. Um, of course, ultimately fear of maybe losing the job. Um, but I was a very young person at the time. And, you know, I confronted the situation like a bull in a china shop uh, at an at a open staff meeting. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking this approach. Um, but I let everyone know um, that it was all of our responsibility to, to protect our colleague. And I, of course, let the supervisor know in front of the whole staff that I wouldn't stand for this type of behavior. Well, um, there was a cost for that. And so the cost was when it was time to renew my job, um, my application somehow got lost. Um, so I absolutely paid the price for speaking up. But I also was paid by knowing that it was my responsibility to speak up and it was my responsibility to do the work and address this unfair treatment. And it, in, my, in my mind, try to create a space of belonging for my staff member, uh, my colleague. So I have many, many stories um, like this, especially when I volunteered um, as a union leader, representing employees facing issues of not feeling a sense of belonging, not having a connection to the workplace. Um, it was my belief that it was my job to call out these barriers to creating spaces of belonging um, with the idea that all people in our spaces should feel a sense of connection. So, I believe that we all have the right to exist in peace without fear of prejudice or discrimination because of the way we look uh, or where we were born or who you choose to love or the God you choose to worship or not. Uh, these are all rights that we should enjoy as humans. We should treat each other how we want to be treated with respect and dignity. We should not divide our humanity, but accept and embrace our differences, those things that actually make us human. There are many of us who watch and accept in inappropriate behavior and treatment of our colleagues and those we serve. Um, you know, we accept the behavior behavior uh, until until it happens to you. Um, I call this upholding the status quo or the existing order. This is why we have to do the work. If not for others, then we have to do this work for ourselves. Uh, because uh, I, I would say one of my favorite quotes um, comes from the good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, injustice, and I know many of you know this quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I mean, these are words that he wrote sitting in a jail cell in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. So Dr. King realized that there were injustices to the human condition everywhere throughout the history of humans. And when you identify injustice, which I will call crimes against humanity as a denial of human rights, the question becomes, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I mean, I would hope you don't just turn your back on unjust and divisive behavior. And, and I say that because today, there will be injustice against a black person. 
Friday, there will be injustice against a person who practices the Jewish faith. Saturday, someone who identifies as LGBTI. Sunday, a person with a disability. Monday, a person who is poor. Tuesday, a person who practices Islam. And then on Wednesday, it'll be you. And I guarantee it will be you. I think that we must not be silent. I think that we must speak up when we see wrong done to others. I think that wrong is wrong. And we must fight for the wrongs as well as the wrongs done to others. It's sort of like what Dr. McCauley said earlier. Uh, she said earlier, internally within our library spaces and externally in our communities. So, I mean, we have to really think about this. Who's going to do this work to create belonging in our library spaces? Who is going to do this work? If there's going to be a change, and and we know that we we all have to be brave, and we or there's going to come at a price at a cost. But if there's going to be a change in the status quo, we must do this work, and we must do this work together, collectively. I, I saw in the chat um, many people saying collect we we must work collectively. Um, you heard. Uh, earlier, Nikhil, she gave a great example of sometimes you're not in a position to to do the work yourself, and so you have to use your alliances, you have to use your the, the, your uh, associations to be able to to bring things to the forefront, to be able to document situations that may be happening. I mean, one thing about the world we live in now that uh, the world is is very small. Um, especially with our communications, something happens, we know about it within minutes, within seconds sometimes. So it's not going to be easy. Doing this work is not going to be easy. But folks, know that we all have a responsibility to protect each other. We have a responsibility to make each other feel safe, feel safe to be a human being, to feel safe to create a sense of belonging and feel safe to create connection in our library spaces. So I'm going to stop there because I want to see if any one of you have any questions or thoughts. Um, I, I didn't want this to be a lecture, um, but it, I wanted to share my thoughts broadly, um, certainly in line with the opening keynote, with, with some of the sessions that I was able to pop in on and give you some, some something to think about. So, um, Steve, how do we go to if there are any questions? So if you'd like to ask a question, you can put it in the chat or you can use the Q&A function uh, for those of you who know how that works in Zoom. We can wait a minute or two and see if anybody makes a note in either hmm. of those ways. I'm looking at some of the, um, I'm looking at some, some of the, the thoughts in the, in the, in the chat. Now, yes, exactly, Angela Davis. If they come for me in the morning, they will come for you at night. And let's not ever forget that, folks. I mean, we're all connected. We're all connected. Looking for any questions, folks. Um, one one thing I, I and I don't want to do this, but I can say that um, when we have meetings, um, it's always great when we say we give some time back. But this is this is one time I don't necessarily want to give any time back um, because we have about ten minutes. But I do want to give an opportunity. To, to have some conversation. And if we were in person, I would tell you that um, I would definitely look for the dialogue. Steve, there was a question about staying informed about other conferences like this. Um, and I know that there may be opportunities for 
uh, more uh, content um, and topics like this. And Sandy, you may want to jump in here. Um, yes, I mean, uh, the best way to be connected is by joining the Library 2.0 network, and then you'll automatically get updates um, about all of the upcoming events. But I also wanted to say to you, Julius, there are a few questions that I see in the Q&A section. Oh. Um, so um, one, one is, does every library have a union? Couldn't this be helpful in addressing many DEIA issues? I'll repeat, I'll repeat that one more time. Is that yeah, it says, there's a couple other questions. Too. Oh, I see it now. Does okay, every, see. okay, did you find it? it? Does okay. every library have a union? Couldn't this be helpful in addressing many? So um, I don't think every library has a, has a union. So that's a very specific type of environment. Um, I think unions can be helpful uh, in, in addressing uh, DEIA issues. Um, I, so, but here's, here's, here's what I want you to know about um, unions and the law. Um, when we think about uh, Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, um, we have to think, I, I think about it in terms, in, in context. So I think about, um, you know, the time in which the bill was passed, uh, 1964, uh, just 10 years before that, um, the, the Brown versus the Board of Education decision Overturn Plessy versus Ferguson, and so you have an you have individuals who lived in a world where they had complete control. When now the world is beginning to change, and I believe that it was a there was certainly a, a backlash, which we saw. Um, but the law it, it is almost um, almost impossible to prove that you were discriminated against based on the law. Um, and I have as a working in a union, I've I had uh, EEO cases. Um, which it looked pretty obvious to me, but certainly didn't meet the test. Uh, the burden of proof is on the individual who was being discriminated against. Um, and so um, that's how the law was written. And so I do think that unions can be helpful um, highlighting a lot a lot of the, um, the issues. Um, I see a question. Okay, two questions. Where do you find support to keep on going? Uh, many of us work alone. Um, I mean, I think... Uh, I I I have found support from my uh, close friends and family, um, but I've also found support in organizations. And I, I can tell you, with uh, everyone who was on that opening panel, I met through through my work um, with the American Library Association. Um, we are colleagues, and we are our friends. Um, and I have many other friends that we share our experiences. Um, and we talk them through and we get ideas on how how we can uh, just kind of deal with some of the things that we we go through at work. Um, it is frustrating. Um, the, the work, the question is, how do you deal with the fatigue of doing this work? Um, I think at this point in my career and, I, and probably always, it's always been about um, having empathy. And you heard uh, you heard that being talked about earlier, empathy, empathy for how, how other people are feeling knowing that I could be next, um, really feeling like it, it, it is my job to um, to be able to help someone, you know, uh, feel like they can make a contribution in, in, in a world and in institutions where they look at you um, based on your so-called race or your gender or your sexual orientation and disability and believe that you're just not going to make a, a difference. But, you know, I... Um, I feel like as long as I'm living, I'm I'm going to keep fighting for folks. Um, I see uh, another question is so you see any kind of payback attitude sometimes? I see oh I see Mona Library has censored different works and has expressed bias against certain religion, but it goes unchecked. Oh absolutely, I see it all the time, especially if if you are going against the status quo. Um, there is there is like this idea of reprisal. Um, and this manifests itself in different ways where if they don't try to get rid of you, that they will kind of marginalize you within your institution, even though you may have great ideas. I mean, one of the things that uh, Dr. McCauley said earlier, I mean, she made such a great point, is that because of our 
own biases against individuals, against human beings, um, we don't make the best decisions for our communities and for our institutions. So she talked about, you know, our hiring practices, and we pick the person who does the best, uh, uh, perceived best in the interview, but really, really doesn't have the, the skill set to serve the people. And um, I, I believe that um, it, it should always be about serving the people. But, you know, when you when you make your voice heard, um, then you, there's an opportunity that you will be marginalized within the, the, the work area and you may not get um, you may not get uh, opportunities. Uh, someone asked Sandy if there's a certificate for the conference. Yes, and I've uh, put a text message back on the schedule page with the links. There's also a link to an evaluation form that produces a certificate if you would like it. All right, those are those are great questions. Um, absolutely. Did you see the one about fatigue? Um, yeah, I think I answered the one about fatigue. Um, let me go back to it. Yeah, I must have been answered. It just asks how you deal with the fatigue of doing this work. Yeah, um, a, a support system with family and friends. I mean, but I, I think I also said that, I mean, as long as I'm breathing, I'm going to do this work because I have empathy for human beings. It's hard for me to sit back and watch someone go through something that I know is unjust. I just can't do it. Um, and so I never really feel like it's it's too much, um, but I do uh, I do feel like it's something that I have to do. And because if I don't, who will? And I hope more people will do it. I think that if more people really took a stand, and I know it's difficult because, it, again, I talked, there is a cost. There is a price. Um, you know, sometimes it's the ultimate price. I mean, we I mentioned Dr. King, and Dr. King paid the ultimate price um, for standing up against an, a, an unjust system. Um, he lost his life. Um, but, boy, he left a legacy for us to work with. And, you know, we're, we should be so thankful that he did that. See, there are two more questions in the Q and A portion. Okay, let me look at. There we go. Um, I feel like if more people just did a little something, it would make things far less exhausting for people who are doing this. Where I, I completely agree, I completely agree, and I, and I think the whole idea. Um, of this mini conference is that we all can do something. And so we hope we motivate everyone to do something. I think that was it. Was that it, Steve? Yeah, there's one. Uh, how do you address DEI issues at the individual level that are openly competing points of view, such as needs based upon religion, LGBTIA plus Semitic and political rights? Wow, I missed that one. Is that at the top? Um, repeat that one more time. Okay, how do you address DEI issues at the individual level that are openly competing points of view, hmm. such as needs based upon religion, LGBTIA plus Semitic political rights. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, I think I would need more information. I, I mean, and I, I'm not really sure. Was that in the was that in the uh, chat? Was that in the, the Q and A? That's in the Q and A. Okay. Um, I think it, it's probably particularly apparent right now with uh, active uh, the actions in the Middle East where you would have uh, two different groups feeling very strongly. So um, he, here's, 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 okay. Um, here's a thought on that. Um, you, so a, a lot of the, so I think one of the ways I, I deal with a lot of the goals in the world, and of course um, you know, I do have somewhat of an advantage just because of um, you know what I do regularly. Um, it's, it's good to, un, and, and Nicole talked about this, it's good to understand the history. It's good to understand the, the, what the existing narrative is and um, at the same time, what the reality is. And so we should never be competing. 
there shouldn't be there's no competition and uh, things that are going to i mean you know uh the idea that um you know people aren't aren't treated as humans that 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 that's that's the bigger issue um you know the the idea of of how things have evolved i mean i think that's that's the the, the bigger the bigger issue i think it's really important um for us not to compete uh, against you know whether someone is from the LGBT community or whether someone is a particular re religion and focus on the individual itself. Um, you know, I think that um, we kind of saw this in, in IFLA um, where, where um, there was some level of, of censorship uh, from the LGBT community. It was an intellectual freedom issue about going to uh, Dubai. Um, but the issue always for me was about the individual um is about individuals not not sort of uh putting us into these these very various categories um but as individuals how are we being treated as, as individuals and i try to focus on that i hope that hope that answers that question all right steve so i guess we're at time and um Am I still on, Steve? You are, and we okay. are out of time. So shall we <laughs> say goodbye? Yes, yes. I thought I was by myself, but I see people are jumping off. So again, thanks, everybody. And um, I hope to see you in your neighborhood uh, sometime very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julius. Thanks to all who have participated. The recordings will be up uh, by Monday. And there is a link to the uh, survey and the certificate form on the schedule page. Take care now. Bye.